All right, well, good morning, Connection Church. Want to wish all the men out there a happy Father's Day. Hey, thanks for taking a minute to join us today. Um, title of my message today is Fight Because Your Blank is Worth It. Now, you may be like, Pastor, what is the blank? That's for you to answer. I don't know what your cause is. I don't know what the thing in your life is that is worth fighting for Um and, and, and it's not, today is, I'm not trying to put on some macho message where to be a man means you got to fight and throw down and all that kind of stuff. But I believe in all of us, there are things in our life, in our world, in our own hearts that are worth fighting for. And I hope today I will encourage you to fight, to stand up for something, because whatever your blank is, it's worth fighting for. Today, my purpose sorry ladies, is to encourage men. As a, I, I have to be honest, as a man, I have always struggled with church and religion. Because when I came to church, I felt like I went from who I was to they tried to make me into something I felt like I wasn't. Somebody, I, I was supposed to be passive. I was supposed to be nice. I was supposed to be just not me, man. I'm not wired that way. I want, there's, there's fire inside of me. And I felt like following Jesus meant I had to be this nice little guy that didn't do anything wrong. And it was hard for me. Um, at, like I said, bro, I, I'm just not wired that way. And so here's my first point today is this. Men, you were created with the heart of a warrior. Now, some of you are going to be like, yeah, we're getting all this weird stuff. Like, you're going to tell us to go in the woods and hunt and all. I don't hunt. I don't fish. I don't do any of those things. But I know inside of my heart is passion. Because I believe every man was created with the heart of a warrior. And here's the reason why. Because it's hard to be a man. Now, I can hear the, the sighs and the thoughts probably running through some people's mind right now going, but it's just as hard to be a woman. I I don't understand that, but I do understand this. It is difficult to be a man. If you just look at practicality, the mortality rate of men is much higher than women. More men commit suicide than do women. 85% of the men who are locked up and incarcerated in our institutions say they have never had any type of father figure in their lives. One of the reasons I believe it's so hard to be a man is because very few women have the ability to leave their children, but it seems like our men have this uh, ability to just walk away. And so there's a lot of us who look for somebody who looks like me to teach me what it is to be me, how to, how to put my strength in the right places, how to learn what it is to, to walk out this gift that God's given me, and I never got that instruction. It's, it's difficult to be a man. You could even go with some biblical examples, even from the very beginning when God brought a deliverer onto the scene with Moses. They killed every male child from, the, from one to two years, from zero to two years old in Egypt. When Jesus came onto the scene, they attacked the male child. Why was that? Because it was in the Garden of Eden after man and woman messed up that God told her, listen, he will, your seed will crush the devil's head. The devil has been after the seed of woman for this entire time. And the seed of woman is her son. It is not easy to be a man. It's not easy to, to live this out. And unfortunately, um, we, we feel like sometimes our strength is, is, a, is a liability. When Here's the thing I would say. When I talk about you were created to be a warrior, and you might even still want to push back on that, but, but you cannot deny the fact that the Bible says we were created in the image of God. We were created to reflect Him. And one of God's characteristics and descriptions happens to be in Exodus 15.3. It says this, The Lord is a warrior, and the Lord is His name. See, the God we serve, he is not just a nice person who just loves everybody, but he is also a warrior, and you were created in that image. I wish they would have taught me that in Sunday school. Maybe not. I probably would have got kicked out even more because I would have justified fighting at that point. But I believe hardwired into every man is, is this DNA and a drive to fight for what is right, to stand up for a cause that makes a difference, to take action and make things happen. 
Now, some of you, you might push back a little bit. And you go, I-, I thought Christians were supposed to be full of love and mercy and grace. And that is all true, but incomplete. See, because there's two sides to that. Jesus was all those things. Sometimes you would see him hanging out with little kids and holding them and and being close to them. You would see him uh, speaking to women that, that nobody else would speak to. He had love. He had compassion. He had grace. But sometimes with Jesus, enough was enough. Take, for example, the time the Pharisees, they just won't stop running their mouth, right? You ever know somebody like that? It's somebody in your life that they just talk and talk and talk and like finally it's just enough is enough and you got to do something about it. Here's these Pharisees just running their mouth and Jesus finally just looks at him and says, man, shut up. Because everything that comes out of your mouth is like a grave. You're not living what you're preaching. In fact, you're nothing but a bunch of snakes. That's not this passive, pretty, oh, everything is Guru Jesus. That is somebody who's got some fire on the inside of him. He would stand down the Pharisees. And then if that wasn't enough for you, he goes to church one day and they're absolutely turning the house of God into a place where they're selling and they're ripping people off and they're making money. And Jesus is just getting ticked. Like, I mean, you understand how it goes, right? You walk into something and you're getting off and you're ready to let go and that's exactly what takes place the bible says in fact he lost his mind to the point where he ripped some cords down and he made whips he flipped over to jesus was flipping tables he said like i'm this you you, this is supposed to be a house of prayer and y'all made it a den of thieves get out the bible says he drove them out of the temple see jesus was full of love he was full of grace But he was also a warrior and he was full of cause and he was full of purpose and he was full of passion. And that probably doesn't fit your Hollywood version of Jesus because he always talked like he was in a bad church play. Right. But that's who he was. Then there was this other time. Right. The Bible says that the men took him to the edge of a cliff and it was their intent to throw him off the cliff. And then in the midst of that, the Bible says Jesus turns around and he looks at the crowd and the crowd parts and he walks through. Do you think Jesus, and I'm going to get a little nostalgic right here, but Wayne's world, right? Like Garth, like, excuse me, I like to get bad now, right? Do you think that's how Jesus, that's exactly what he did to part the crowd? Man, I wonder if Jesus just flipped around and he just started looking at these guys. He's like, no, no, not today. This ain't happening today. And all of a sudden the crowd parts and he walks through. Mm. See, he was not just this play nice kind of guy. He had passion. He had strength. He had power. And you were made in his image. Now, some of y'all may be like, Pastor, you're taking way too much liberty with this. You might be right. But where I'm not taking liberty is this. He fought for you. He fought three days. He went to a cross and he died for you. And the Bible says then he fought death. He fought hell. He fought sin. And he fought the grave. And he conquered it. And that's what he did for you. And a weak person, somebody who's just trying to be nice, can't do that. It has to be, there has to be a fight and a passion on the inside. And then if you want to go even towards the end of the book, the Apostle John, he gives a vision of Jesus coming back at the end of, in, in the, end of the world. And he says this in Revelations chapter 19, verse 11. He said, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true and with justice he judges and he wages war his eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns and he has a name written on him that no one knows but himself he is dressed in a robe that is dipped in blood And his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule with them with an iron scepter. He treads on the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh. He has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the image you were created in. And Jesus has tattoos. Some of you tripping right now, but the reality is it says and on his thigh is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, mom, you're like, you can't get tattoos. That's not Christian. 
but Jesus has tattoos. I'm getting in trouble for that one. Amen. But <laughs> let me keep writing. The greatest servant and warrior that ever lived, and you were created in his image. So, gentlemen, let me ask this question today. What have happened to all of the warriors? Where have all the men of God gone? Where are the men that will stand up and fight for the things that need to be fought for? Where is the passion that burns inside of you? My, my fear is this, is we've been aborting that passion for years. And this isn't something new. We see this in throughout all of Scripture. When God needed a man and he looked for him, the Bible would say he found him off playing video games and doing meaningless things. Maybe not really fact, but it does say in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, it says, I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it, but I found no one. God said, I was just looking for this kind of man. I only needed one of them. I didn't need a bunch. I needed a man. And I looked and I looked and I found no one. So again, I ask this question, where have all the fighting men gone? If we're going to get real honest, I think there has been an attack in our culture. See, one thing that I think is true and it's kind of scary is our culture fears a man's strength. The reality is this, so many men have not had the instruction we needed of what to do with that passion and strength that's inside of us. We've been taught that it's almost like this beast that we have to keep at bay. So we find ourselves fighting ourselves instead of channeling this. It's almost like we're a dam trying to hold back how we've been wired instead of channeling it and using that passion to do the good in this world that it was intended to do. But what I see more and more is because we haven't had the instruction, because often when we look for someone who looks like us to teach us what it means to be us, we don't see a certain, that same person staring back to us. And I'm not talking about uh, just the, 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 the men that are, are not involved in their kid's life. Because, look, today is not a bash session, man. I don't want to make fathers feel low. This is a, not a put down but a come up. My hope today is that I pull you up, man, because I need you to hear today. We need you. We need you. And we don't blame you. Because here's what we know. Very few of us have ever had a man in our life to teach us what it is to be a man. To tell us how to live. To how, to, how, to, how to use this strength and passion that is inside of me for the things that are good. And like, like a flood... When you don't have anything to channel it, it goes all the, over everywhere. And the most destructive thing is moving water that hasn't been channeled. When it's channeled, it can do great things. It can power cities. It can create food. I mean, it can do so many amazing things. But when not channeled, it can be absolutely destructive. And unfortunately, there's so many men that have never been channeled. And so that destruction has hurt. And we've hurt a lot of women. And, and, and what I believe we're seeing more and more is this process is now a man's strength has become not his power, but his liability. Because the women that have been hurt by the strength of a man has sons, and they don't want to have that liability in their life. So they do everything they can to teach that boy how to be a good boy. And there's nothing wrong with being kind, but trying to make him nice and trying to make him passive and trying to make him into something that he's not. And then all of a sudden the rage and the fire comes up on the inside and we want to push it down. That's not supposed to be pushed down. That's supposed to be channeled in the right direction because there's power behind that. So as a man, in a sense, we feel this sense of impotence and it's frustrating because we're not understanding why is this inside of me if it isn't supposed to go somewhere. And without the instruction, we find it goes everywhere. I think, I think culture also in, in their attempt to bring equality between man and women, and I'm not, I'm not debating that subject. I think God says he sees not male nor female. He is no respecter of persons in the sense that a male is better than a female. But what we have done in a culture is we've tried to belittle the man to the point to bring him down to the level that the woman might feel like she's at. And I think we're messing up in that place 
Because tell me a comedy that you see where the father isn't made out to be some idiot. Some guy who's disconnected and knows nothing. We, we do everything we can to, to try and bring equality. And our, our mindset is in this equality, uh, we will devalue the man so we can bring them to the same level that the woman feels like she's on. And you don't bring equality by devaluing a man. You bring equality by teaching a man how to treat a woman the right way, how to be not, that they don't need, their, their strength is not something that, that is used to lord over anybody, but is there to, to help those around them. And, 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 and when you're confident and when you're secure in who you are, you can allow other people to be who they are and not feel intimidated by that. But when you bring him down, all you do is make him believe he's just a dumb kid and then you get mad when he acts like a dumb kid but yet that is the message that the world keeps speaking and then you even see this in relationships too often when couples get together she wants to marry a man she wants a man but she wants him to, she wants her man to act like like a woman, right? Wants him to think like a woman and listen like a woman. Like, why can't you listen to me the way I need to be listened to? Wants him to clean like a woman. Sir, you ever tried to clean to your wife's standards and ever found that that is a wow? <laughs> it might take an act of Jesus for that to work out. And it even goes so far as, as even who we are has become an insult. You ever heard those words? You're such a man. As if and now that's a bad thing. That's a negative thing. It becomes an insult. Listen, I want to tell you something. The greatest thing my wife ever did for me is see the man that God created me to be. I can't think of anything more that, that, that she celebrates and she speaks to the strengths that God, said God has given me. And can I be honest with you? It's not easy for her because my strengths often take me away from her because my strength is to create, to build, to do, to, to see wrongs in the world and right those wrongs. And that takes me away from her sometimes. And I know that isn't easy. And she's listening to me right now. And baby, I love you and I appreciate this so much. Because if she tried to turn me into something I wasn't, I would never find fulfillment and contentment. And I would constantly be looking for something more. And she doesn't, here's the, the amazing part is, though she sees my strengths take me away, she doesn't make me pay for that. She's proud of it. And she celebrates it. I'm empowered by the woman that knows me best to be the man that God created me to be. There's no strength, there's no infusion of power that comes greater than that besides God himself. Ladies, you want the men in your life to do great things. Your husbands, your sons, your fathers. Lady, listen, you have a superpower. Don't tell him what is not. Tell him what you see in him. Speak the truth of what is in there. You may not even see it yet manifested, but women, I know this to be true. You have an intuition to see greatness sometimes inside of us, and that greatness may scare you at times, but I pray to God if you'll speak that out, you're going to see your man rise to it. Don't tell him what he doesn't do right. Don't tell him how he doesn't get it right. You have the power to build him up, to encourage. Think of that word for a minute, encourage. You have literally the power to put courage inside of the person that you love. Maybe you are a single mom listening today, and it's been a hard message, but hear me, mom. You have the opportunity to put courage into that man in your life. And he only may be eight years old right now, but you can put courage inside of him. You have that power to be someone who can fight and stand for what is right. It reminds me of the story. We know it, right? David, the little boy that took a sling and killed a giant. The Bible says God sent Samuel to his house. And God said to Samuel, I have found my man. Samuel was quite perplexed when the men of the house walked by and it was not it, not it, not it. Why? Because David was a boy. He was still a kid. He wasn't a man. See, but that's the problem is there's a lot of kids out there that no one's ever seen a king inside of them and ever called it out of them. And here's 
the truth. Inside every kid is a king. And that king needs to be called out. Because if it's never called out, we'll keep acting like a kid the rest of our life. And some of you, some of you got to listen to me today. Some of the mistakes you've made and the things you found yourself caught up in, it's because nobody's ever looked at you and said, there's a king in there. They've only ever seen a little kid and you've acted like that. I'm here to speak into your life today, sir, and say inside of you is a king. Inside of you is purpose. Inside of you is power. And my hope is I can reach in and pull it out today and get you to begin to believe what I say. Inside of every kid is a king. However, the same is true. Inside of every king is still a kid. And too often, the struggles in our life come from that place. As we grow up and we take power and we take position and oftentimes the things we do to try to make our hearts better lead us to places of success. And we get promoted and we look like a king, but the reality is inside of that king is also still a kid. Carrying some of the same mindsets they have for too many years. Listen, hear me, fellas. I ain't trying to say being a man means that that you got to be some alpha bully punk, right? Some of the greatest men in my life have been men who've been sensitive, compassionate, because they had to be. Because if they would have come at me strong, I wouldn't have been able to hear it. They had to be men that would meet me where I was in my mess and my brokenness. They love deeply. There's some men listening to me right now, you do love deeply. And every, your whole life, you've seen that as a liability. And I would, I would push back on that right now and say that is absolutely your superpower. You were created with the heart to love people. We need more men who can love people and not see that as weakness, but understand that's the gift that God gave you. Sir, I believe whatever your superpower is, is part of what God put in you. And he reminds you, you are from him. You are a king. There's a thing that reminds you of who you're not, how often you don't measure up. No one's ever seen the king inside of your kid, so you're 40 years old still acting like a kid. And that brings me to the kid part. Again, brings me to, as I bring this somewhat to a close today, you've got to fight because your blank is worth it. Hear me today, every warrior has to have a cause to fight for. Something happens when we feel like we find our purpose. Nehemiah, when he was called to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem after everything had fallen, the enemies came to fight him and distract him. And in Nehemiah 14, 4, it says, don't, God, don't be afraid of them. Nehemiah is talking to the armies around. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your home. That's one of those brave heart moments in the Bible right there, right? Where he calls him out and says, hey, fight. I love that movie. Who doesn't, right? He, on the field, his face is painted blue. Talks about it. And you would give every moment of your life, every day to come back and fight this day for freedom. Like there's something that rises up on the inside because you find your cause. Let me ask you again this morning, what is your cause? What's the blank in your life that you need to fight for? The thing in your life that's worth giving your life for? Because here's the truth is when you find a cause, something inside of you comes alive. Maybe you're listening to me today and you're like, man, I, I know it. I need to start fighting for my marriage. Like I, even, I need to own my mistakes. I need to humble myself. I need to treat her and love her the way Christ loves me. And so today I need to fight because your marriage is worth it. And that might be true. Some of you, you might be listening and you're saying, you know what, I'm looking at my life and during this coronavirus, like I was really attentive to my kids, but as things have relaxed and we've gone back to normal, I find myself more and more busy with the things that used to distract me. And I'm doing a lot of things in pursuit of success, though I'm missing out on the people that are in my house. I'm trying to win the world and in the same time, I'm missing my kid. And they only have one dad. And there's other people that may raise up in their life and they may fill gaps. But I can tell you the truth. Nobody takes your place. 
You're the only one that gets to hold that position. Some, to some of you men, you need to think maybe it's time to adjust some priorities because it's not too late to make a difference. And you need to say, I need to fight because my kids are worth it. And here's real. No man with a wife or kids or family or whatever, somebody were to come up in your house and try to harm them. I don't know of any man that would sit and just let it happen. Even if you can't stop them, I think you would die trying. And the reality is this. It's easy to die once. It's easy to, to picture and imagine that scenario where somebody's coming in to hurt the people that you love. And what would you do? It's easy to die once. But a man of God, he dies for them daily. That's the difference. It's easy to give up a once and all sacrifice, but when you die for somebody daily, when you put your own wants and your own desires and your own success and your own everything else on the side to make sure that they get the best of you, now that's a man. Somebody who's willing to lay their life down daily for the people that they love. Another thing I want you to keep in mind is a warrior without a cause to fight for will find the wrong things to fight against. When you don't have a cause to fight for, there is something inside you that needs out and you will fight the wrong things. We see this with Saul, the guy who later became Paul. He has this passion and he wanted to make a difference. And that's what I loved about him, man. He, his passion never stopped, right? Right? He had a passion to do great things. In the very beginning, when we first see him, the Bible says he is out and his passion was to destroy the church. This Jesus movement that was taking place, he was single-handedly going to destroy it. And then he has this moment, this encounter with Christ, and next thing you know, he's doing everything to build the church. What happened? The passion just switched. The purpose switched from the wrong thing to the right thing, from the thing that was leading him in a wrong direction to the thing that was right. But the common denominator inside of him was passion. He just moved it into the right direction. That's why give me somebody all day long that might be messed up doing stupid things, but they're doing things. I'll take them any day over a good person who sits on their butt and does nothing. Because I can teach you how to do, take your passion and move it in the right direction, but I can't teach you how to have passion. I can't put fire inside of your belly. I can direct your fire in the right way, but I can't put it on the inside of you. And some of you, listen to me today, you are passionate. You might be passionate doing some really bad things right now. There's purpose inside of you, man. Don't let the enemy confuse you. You are not a waste. That potential and that passion in you turned in the right direction. There's no limit to where that can go. All too often, you feel like being good means I've got to be passive. I just, I believe it means you take your passion, put in the direction of harming and destroying and self-seeking, and you move it into the direction of doing something great for other people, and that's where you start to find your purpose. And some of you might be like, Pastor, I don't even know what my purpose is. What is the thing that makes you mad? What is the thing that you see happening in the world that you can't stand? It's a really good indication of that is where your passion lies. So I would encourage you today, man, don't let that passion go out. But as a warrior, when you don't have a cause to fight for, you will find yourself fighting the wrong things. But what I need you to hear from me today and strength and passion is not bad. And when you have been loved and protected by strength, there's goodness in that. Here's the struggle, though. There is a fight and there is a passion in each and every one of us men. And if it's not directed the right way, we will find ourselves fighting against wrong things. We will fight against authority. We'll fight against ourselves and we'll hate ourselves. We'll take it out on the ones that we have loved the most. We'll even fight those that are trying to help us. But unfortunately, the saddest one of those is how we fight against ourselves. I can remember the moment I was in my counselor's office and we were talking 
And I said something to the effect of like, man, I just feel like there is this monster inside of me that I must hold down and keep at bay. And I must keep him restrained because if he gets out, there's no, there's no telling the destruction that is going to take place. And he looked at me and he says, there's no monster in you. You are a man of God. You love Jesus. For that thing to come out, it would take you to violate so many rules inside of your heart. See, somewhere along the line, I started to believe that there was evil on the inside of me. And my job as a man, as a man of God, was to hold back the evil. And I spent so much energy fighting against myself when God wanted me to release that energy because he can fight that battle for me. He's the one who transforms me from the inside. It was really, I was fighting a lie. I wonder how many of you hearing that right now, you would resonate with that truth. Because you believe there's some evil inside of you, though it's never manifested for years. But you still believe there's, there's this darkness in you. I would say if you are a follower of Jesus, that is not accurate. Because the Bible says he takes out of my heart of, of, of darkness and flesh and he puts his heart inside of me of life and light and spirit. And that's who God is and what he wants to do. But when we don't understand, we'll fight ourselves. I've often heard it said, you've got to find your cause greater than yourself. But here's my question, sir, and I'm going to make it really real. What if the cause you need to fight for is yourself? When we fight for our marriage with kids, that'll make sense. Because that's the champion, that's the white horse riding in saying, I'm here to save the day and every man wants to be a hero. How do we fight for ourselves? And what does that look like? I read something the other day in a, in a group that I was in, the journey groups that we do here at church. It said this, and it really resonated with me. It says, there is no shame in how a child survives. Hear that. Some of you, the weakness in your life, the struggles in your life, really it's just you learning to survive. And unfortunately, because of the script that's been written in many of our lives, we've done a lot of things to learn how to survive. And some of you are still fighting the shame from back when, from some of the things that you've done. Because somebody convinced you, how, how could you do such a thing? I'll tell you how. Because you're a survivor. Because you learn to survive. You learn to take care of your heart, to watch yourself. To, 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 if nobody was going to take care of you, you were going to take care of yourself. And many of you did a good job doing it. You just got caught up in some stuff in the process that have got you all tangled up. But there is no shame in how a child survives. And there is forgiveness for an, how an adult has lived sinfully in response to his or her pain. Whatever you've done to survive the world you had to come up in, there's no shame in that. And the sin that you might be bound in right now, there is forgiveness for that. You understand, you don't have a father God who's looking at you going, I can't believe you can't get it right. He understands exactly why you did the things you did and why you're caught up in what you're caught up in now. And he is saying, I don't shame you and I have forgiveness for you. I want you to be free. I want you to live the fullness of what I have for you. How do we move forward? See, here's what I found in my life is too often in my life, because of the comfort maybe I never got at times, my comfort has led to my addictions. Now, let me clarify that. I'm not just talking substance use disorder like drugs, alcohol, whatever. Addiction is anything you turn to to comfort the pain in your heart. Every man listening to me, you have an addiction. It's like this, every, you know, you ever heard the saying, uh, boys and their toys, right? We all have toys. Whether you're five years old, you got toys. Whether you're 50 years old, you got toys. Just the reality is we just pay a lot more for our toys now. And now some of the things we play with may not cost us money, but they cost us everything. We all have that struggle. We all deal with this. And typically the toy is to bring comfort, is to bring solace. 
and we're still looking for some of those things. See, drugs can be addiction, but so can achievement. Some of us, we've been playing the scoreboard our whole life, right? Never feeling like we measure up. So we spend our entire life trying to prove ourselves to somebody. To get that attaboy that we never got from the person we were looking for. And we strive and we strive. And the problem with some of our addictions is they, they cause us to be celebrated. Nobody looks at somebody who's achieving great things and says, you got a problem. No, we say, that guy's awesome. That guy's doing it. That guy has the world. And what people don't understand is just another toy. Another thing to try and comfort my heart. Because the brain says, if I get it, I'll be good. And here's the issue. I get it, and it's still not enough. You're going to have to fight to figure out how to stop this thing that keeps driving you to sabotage your life. And in the church, we're good at looking at the big things and going, yeah, that affair, those drugs, this, that, all those negative things, those porn, like that's the sabotage of your life. But man, there's some people, you've got things in your life that everybody else would call good and it's absolutely sabotaging your life. You're going to have to learn to fight some of those things. You're going to have to fight to figure out why you have this drive to keep moving there, to deal with the real pain, to face some scary demons and it's not easy, and it will take a battle, and that is why God put a warrior inside of every man's heart, because, sir, you are going to have to fight for yourself. Like me, it is much easier to fight for others. I look at other people struggling, and I want to help. I want to do something. You can call it a Jesus complex, and you might even be right, but it's easy for me to see the value in others, but it's real hard sometimes to see that I'm worth fighting for. The other thing, too, is when I fight for myself, it doesn't look like a regular fight. I wish to God sometimes the devil would just manifest and we could throw hands, right? Like, I just wish I could let that rage out sometimes. It would feel good, even if he whooped my tail. It would just feel like I've done something. But when I'm talking to you today, sir, about fighting for yourself, we fight a little differently. As much as I wish I could throw fists, that is not how the fight is won. As I close, I was asking God, what do I say? How do I close this down? What do I, I, I've opened up a lot of stuff, but how do I bring anything to closure when it comes to this? And I felt like he led me to Isaiah 61.1. I'm reading it from the voice translation, so it might be different in your Bible than on the screen. It says it this way. It says, the spirit of the Lord, the eternal one, is on me. The first thing it says is the Lord has appointed me for a special purpose. Hear me today, sir. Hear me today, young man. Hear me today, boy. The Lord has appointed you for a special purpose. There is not a person on this earth that does not have purpose for something. God has a purpose for your life. I don't care what anybody else has said to that. God says the Lord has appointed me For a special purpose. You have purpose. And here's reality. When you don't understand your purpose, you will never step into your plan. Because you will spend your whole life trying to find what am I here for? Why do I exist? My paycheck just doesn't seem to be enough. I give myself everything I want or I say I want and it still isn't enough. You will never find purpose in stuff Purpose comes from the inside of you. I say this to the people I work with in recovery. My goal for you is not just to get sober. It is to find a purpose that will keep you sober the rest of your life. It's not about stopping doing something. It's about doing something that moves you on. You understand my purpose in following Jesus and leading this church has kept me from doing some stupid things in my life that if all I was trying to do was not do dumb things, I would have done those dumb things. It was purpose that moved me forward. And I'm telling you today, I don't care what anybody's ever said, you have purpose. Don't let anybody question that. He goes on to say, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
we read that and I think we think of people that don't have much stuff. I would challenge you to reframe that for a moment. There are some of us who are in abject poverty emotionally. There are some of us who have so much poverty when it comes to being loved and being cared for and being taken care of. There's some of us, we are, we are destitute. And if you could see on the outside our poverty like you see on the inside, you would be like, oh my gosh. But no one sees that. But here's what's truth is, and this is where it comes to fight for yourself. If you're going to fight for yourself, you've got to be honest with yourself. And you have to admit at times that I, I got nothing. I wasn't given what I should have been given. I wasn't equipped with the things that I should have been equipped with. And I have spent my whole life trying to be enough, and it's not enough. And I'm tired. And I feel like I can't keep going sometimes. So I just chase one thing after another because emotionally, I'm bankrupt. Emotionally, there's nothing left. And it's killing me. And the good news is, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. And in exchange for my nothing, he will give me everything. There's a verse in the Bible that says, blessed are the poor. What does it mean to be poor? I've, I've been poor. It never felt blessed to me. Here's what poor means in that. Poor means that I have nothing to offer God, and in exchange for my nothing, he will give me everything. Do you want to know what the good news of Jesus is, sir? That you are not loved and, and cared for because of your performance. You are cared for because you belong to him. That's good news. It isn't about what you do or what you don't do. That's not where your value comes from. Your value comes in the fact that you are his son, that you are the one that he loves, that you are the one that he's called, that he has chosen, that he has put purpose in, and your purpose is not determined by what you do or what you don't do. You still have purpose. That's what I'm trying to get you to hear from me today. That's good news because there's so many of us in our lives as men, we play from one scoreboard to the next. Can I make my wife happy? Can I make my boss happy? Can I make my girlfriend happy? Can I? Well, hopefully if you have a wife and a girlfriend, nobody's going to be happy about that. But you understand what I'm talking about, right? Who can I make happy? How can I make the world like me? And how can I please everybody? And God says, give it up. You don't have to because I love you regardless. My love for you is not based on your performance. It's based on you belong to me and you're my son. Goes on to say, he sent me to repair broken hearts. This is the hardest part of the fight. Is when I just have to stand. The fight in me is the fight not to run. This has been the hardest thing for me lately is when I feel like God goes in and he wants to deal with my heart and everything in me wants to run. And I have to fight to stay in that place. I have to fight to stay long enough in that sadness for God to be in the healing that's supposed to take place. And I hate it. Because here's what happens. When the sadness comes in, the voices in my head that I've heard my whole life saying, you have no reason to cry, I will give you something to cry about, starts to kick in. And I start to talk myself out of why do I feel bad about myself? I have it much better than, any, than other people. Why I, I shouldn't be complaining. I am, and I don't, I don't care for myself enough to stand in that place and let God do the work that he wants to do. And there's some men, if you're listening to me right now, if anybody were to cross you, you would knock them sideways. But you will not fight for yourself. You don't love yourself enough right now to stand in the place of sadness and sorrow and let God heal the person that's inside there. And like me, you want to run. You can't even stand this message right now. I get it. Preached this to me three years ago, and I would have swiped right and been done with this. Moved on in that Facebook feed for sure. But the battle is not fought with these. The battle is fought standing on these. And standing in a place of pain and hurt and struggle. And being willing to stay there long enough for God to do the work that he wants to do. And it ain't easy when he's repairing, he's restoring, and that takes time, and it takes process, and it isn't quick. 
and it doesn't happen instantaneously, and I want my fix now. And God's like, I'm trying to restore something that has been destroyed, but when I'm done, it'll be better than it's ever been. Finally, it ends with this. And to declare those who are held captive and bound in prison, be free from your imprisonment. We're trying to do the first thing first, or excuse me, the last thing first. You come to an altar, you pray a prayer, you look up to heaven and you say, God, can you just free me from this addiction, this struggle, this thing that keeps consuming my life? And you're trying to get that first. Here's what I feel like the Lord would say. Go back to the beginning of the verse. Because the things I spoke to you before is what will lead you to this place. You have a special purpose. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. You are not something that was a forethought. You are, you are worth it. Even if somebody in your life never saw it, God says, I see it. And though you might be broke on the inside, there's good news. I've come to bring you my goodness in exchange for your money. But just like any kind of gift, you have to receive that from me. If I gave you something, you would have to receive it for that transaction to take place. God says, I have goodness for you. But you have to first be honest and acknowledge you're poor in that place. And then God says, but I need then to repair the brokenness. Because when all of those things take place, then you find so many of us, we just want to pray the prayer and get the quick fix. God, get me out of this situation. God's like, I ain't trying to just rescue you. I'm trying to deliver you. I'm trying to set you free from the things that keep bringing you back into that same mess. So as I close today, hear me today, man. You will only be as strong as you are honest. Superman is not Clark Kent. Clark Kent is Superman. But you cannot be Superman if you don't know your kryptonite. Every man, listen to me right now, you do have a kryptonite. There is something in you. There is a liability inside of you. Oftentimes, it has much to do with us still trying to fill a void from ever since we were this big, and we're still playing that game. So here's what I want to ask you. Would you bow your head and just close your eyes? Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask that you just start searching hearts right now. Sir, I hope today this has been a come up for you, not a push down, not a put down, not beating down any man. God doesn't beat you down. God doesn't look at you and say, I thought you were better than that. You're hearing your father's voice when you hear that stuff. Earthly father. Earthly authority says things like that. God says, I know you. I know you. And everyone else around sees a kid, but I see a king. And I put that king inside of you. But the only way we ever get to the king is we've got to deal with that hurt kid because he will always be a liability to the king. It's what caused David to be out after he was king, after he killed giants, after he had slayed thousands, after he was leading the children of Israel. He was out on his balcony, sees a naked woman bathing, and says to himself, if I had that, I would be happy. Keep in mind, this is the same boy that wasn't even invited to the house when Jesse said, go get your sons and bring them here. You don't think that boy was still that king, that mighty warrior. Still there was a kid that was broken on the inside of him, looking for something to still fulfill him. He was on top of the world at the time. And he was willing to sell it out for one night. And he sold so much for that moment. The Bible says, because of what you've done, David, the sword would never leave your house. God says, your dream was to build my house, my temple, and I won't let you do it because of this sin you've committed. He sacrificed so much for that moment because he didn't understand what his liability was, and that liability cost him everything. So I ask right now, and I pray the Holy Spirit would speak to you in this moment, in this season, what is your kryptonite? What is your weakness? What is the thing? Man of God, I'm not saying that you, you don't have it together, but there is something on the inside of you that if you don't get a hold of it, it will own you. 
It will cause you to give up everything for a moment to try and fill a gap in your heart that still has yet to be filled. What's your kryptonite, man? What's the battle in your life right now that you must win? What is the fight that you must fight? Maybe, maybe you're fighting for somebody else. Maybe you need to fight for your marriage. Maybe when I talked about kids, there's something in you that says, man, I got to fight for my kids. Some of you, all those things are noble and all those things are good. And you've tried every one of them. And you find yourself in this repetitive cycle. I'm going to do better in my marriage this time. And the next thing you know, you're screwing up again. I'm going to be more with my kids. And you're still screwing up. Why can't I get this right? Because, King, that kid inside of you is still looking for the affirmation that it never got. And it's still trying to get someone to say, at a boy. And your wife and your kids aren't always great at that. So you look for something, whether it be work or whether it be another person or something that's going to give you that affirmation that's finally going to fill that gap inside of your heart and make you feel like you're somebody that you've never been. And it's just not enough. If there's not enough stimulus in those relationships to give you what you need. So you keep looking and you keep looking. And God says, I want you to fight for you. I died so you could be free and restored and, and, and transformed. You're putting the wrong things first. You need to come first. Because if I can get your heart right, you will love your wife the way I've called you to love her. You'll love your kids and be attentive the way I've called you to because you don't need them to fulfill you. You find that from the place where it only can come from me. Some of you, God wants you to stand up and he wants you to fight. And I end this title with this. You need to fight. Fight because your heart is worth it. You need to fight, man, because you are worth it. This ain't about being a better husband or being a better father. It's about being a better protector of your own heart and letting God heal that place. He loves you today. He does not condemn you. He is not putting you down. He is not saying that you're less than. He is saying you have everything inside of you to fulfill the king that I've called you to be. But we can't get to the king until we deal with the kid. Because the kid's always going to be your liability. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak to the heart of every man. I pray speak to the heart of every woman listening right now. Because too often I don't know they understand it and see it recognize it. They recognize the results of it. And they're so frustrated with themselves and they feel like maybe I'm just not enough. No, 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 no. Honey, you're fine. The problem is nobody sometimes has ever seen the king in us. And we got married and pretended to be adults, but we still acting like kids. And unfortunately, the people that should have done that in our life have never done that. So I challenge you today. I challenge you today, lady, to call the king out of him even the one coming up in your house right now to speak the kingship in his life. Love that man. See that man for who he is called to be and not just how he's acting right now. And sir, I speak to you right now and I say, do not be ashamed. There's no shame in what you've done as a kid to survive because we've done some crazy stuff to get through the stuff we've been through. And there is forgiveness for the sin we've committed to deal with the brokenness of our hearts. And God has a plan of restoration. I've made it sound so simple, and I wish it was this easy. It ain't. It takes time. It takes work. It takes people. Soon as we come back together, we'll get together. We're probably going to get our journey groups going again. Man, that group has been transformative in my life. I would encourage you to get in one of those, check them out, and deal with that crap. It's worth it. It's worth it because as that stuff gets out the way, as the distractions and the addictions get removed, the purpose comes out. And when you live in your purpose, there is no greater fulfillment in all the world than living in that place. God bless you all. Thank you so much for checking in with us today. Happy Father's Day. Um, man, when it comes to church, we got a board meeting this week where we're going to be discussing more about what does it look like to come back into the building and how do we do that safely. But keep praying for us for wisdom. Man, but God bless you guys. Dads, husbands, sons, boys, man of God, you are there's a king inside of every one of you. Don't let that kid keep you back. Amen. Have a great week.